Hi, Keith Livingston here again with Healthy Intelligent Training, bringing you some very interesting people from the endurance world. Our next guest is arguably one of the most interesting in terms of his knowledge of nutrition and how to reverse diseases of aging, otherwise known as diseases of disuse. So Gary Moller is 66 and he's a two-time world champion in the UCI Mountain Bike World Championships in his age group. And uh, just check out what he was doing a couple of years ago for a reasonably regular long all day Sunday ride. We start in Brooklyn, head up the west side of the harbour, turn right below the Patoni foreshore, head down on the east side of Wellington Harbour, down past Eastbourne, heading down to Pencaro Head, around the shingle. Beach, around the Wainui Omata head, up the east coast of the bottom part of the North Island, below the foothills of the Rimatakas, head inland across farmland, and gradually we come up the west side of Lake Waira Rapa. That's it there some pretty high hills, cut inland, go well up the hills to the highest point which is well over a thousand feet, descend back down behind Upper Hut and the reservoir there, have a 66 kilometres an hour down there, in behind Upper Hut now, heading down the Hut Valley, screaming down towards the return journey to Wellington, back along the west side of the harbour, beside the motorway, back into Wellington and return. 164 kilometres in 8,038 of riding. Wow. Hand over to you, Gary. Well, I guess I should start by showing you my medals. Uh, that's, that's my first uh, UCI gold medal which I won two years ago. And that's uh, the one which I won this year. Each of those uh, by more than two minutes, uh, which over a race which is about one hour, or an hour to one hour 20, that's a big winning margin and against uh, very tough competition. The fields are small, but th those who turn up there are there to win. Uh, they're not there for a recreational ride. And uh, they tend to be the, the toughest roosters surviving many years of competition. So um, oh, I'm very proud of that achievement. Um, but it, it's taken a lot of work. Um, it's taken a lot of, uh, uh, I think, very smart training, uh, which becomes uh, even more crucial as we get older. It's yep. far more complicated as we get older, Keith. Okay. Now... Why does it get so much more complicated as you get older? With a young person, uh, the, the, you can throw just about any kind of uh, half-decent training program at them and you'll get pretty good results if the talent is there. Uh, with ageing, uh, you get uh, metabolic imbalances um, uh, developing. Um, you get the cumulative effects of um, overtraining um, injuries. Uh, then, uh, and also, of course, you get um, diseases associated with aging setting in, you know, arthritic changes, um, changes in cardiovascular function, the onset of disease such as um, arteriosclerosis, um, insulin resistance, uh, and then, of course, uh, all the gut issues, diverticulosis, various bowel diseases, and so on, which, um, and then, uh, Neurological issues, um, uh, you know, which develop into things like uh, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis. And uh, to be an enduring athlete, uh, certainly from, uh, I think, sort of 50, 55, 60, uh, those sorts of ages, it becomes more an issue of um, health management. Uh, being able to, uh, like, I've had a goal of being 20 years ahead of disease trying to anticipate disease 20 years in advance and taking uh, corrective measures 
you see, by the time uh, your doctor says, um, Houston, we have a problem, uh, that really um, is akin to flaming out in the atmosphere in a million little bits. Um, but what we should be doing is um, taking uh, uh, corrective measures while you are still on the launch pad. In fact, um, even before you're well, uh, even when you're well away from the launch pad, um, so that uh, you never end up with a health disaster. And uh, hey, that's that's how that's what I make my living out of. And uh, and uh, I am using myself very much as um, sort of a, a a pioneering guinea pig uh, in my own business and a way of illustrating that what I do works. Um, uh, you know, chasing these world championships and that is um, expensive and it takes a lot of money. Uh, from a place like New Zealand, um, it means enormous amounts of travel, which I don't like. Um, but um, what better way that, to demonstrate um, proactive uh, health management than uh, being uh, an age group world champion in a bruising and well, absolutely brutal sport like mountain biking. Share with us, Gary, what you were like at the age of 50. <laughs> well, uh, when I turned 50, Keith, um, I shed a few tears. Um, it was a miserable birthday. Um, I felt terrible. Um, I was extremely tired. Um, uh, I was seeing a um, cardiologist about a um, pretty non-specific heart problem. Uh, I, I had the habit of um, passing out on occasions. Um, my blood pressure becomes so low. My maximum pulse on one exercise stress test uh, was uh, 108. That was the sort of the putts. That was that was bad. Um, I had to stop the test because I thought I was going to pass out, die. Uh, seriously, <laughs> um, and um, uh, it, um, I'd basically burn myself out. A, a combination of um, of things, Keith. Uh, um, competing hard, trying to keep up with guys like you, uh, from about the age of fourteen, uh, which of course was an impossible task. So I, I'd really thrashed myself. Um, I did quite well in some some sports, uh, such as multi sports, but um, combine that with um, uh, running marathons and uh, then the stress of starting a business uh, and uh, having a marriage that failed and looking after three little children. All of those things. Oh, and the other thing, Keith, is. Uh, uh, the, the more stressed and exhausted and unwell I became, um, the more I followed the standard nutritional guidelines, which I'd been taught at university and so on. So I moved increasingly onto a heart-healthy heart diet, um, cholesterol, low cholesterol, etc. And um, uh, <laughs> when I look back on it, uh, I was doing all the wrong things. And um, and by the time I was 50, I was, um, oh, well, in my 40s, I was toast. And by the time I was in 49, I'd reached a point where I said to my partner, Alofa, um, I just can't go to work anymore. I was just too, too exhausted. So I literally gave away a million dollar business um, for next to nothing. And uh, went home, became a house husband and... Um, Rested, contemplated my navel for a few years, and um, went back to university, and then began the journey of a gradual rebuilding as I began to figure out um, what I was doing wrong. How did you do that? How did you figure out what was going wrong? Um, was well, I always um, believed, you know, the the old mantra that you know, um, you know, you, you can get everything you need in a in your food. And um, you know, vitamins were expensive urine. I, I used to um, ridicule my sister Lorraine, who um, um, used to take vitamins quite a lot at times. I thought, and um, 
but you know, hey, I was the one who was toast and she was the one who got the Olympic medal. <laughs> so I wonder who was right and who was wrong there. <laughs> of course, she, she had a few other qualities like a dogged determination, like never give up. Um, and, um, uh, but the real breakthrough for me, Keith, was when I was um, introduced to uh, the interclinical hair tissue and mineral analysis. Um, I, I just got a, I got a call from uh, the agents um, uh, in New Zealand and they said, oh, hey Gary, um, we've just taken the agency for this um, new test and um, we thought you might be interested. And I started, um, uh, I did the test on myself. I went to Australia, attended a, a few courses and um, started to realise uh, that, um, you know, um, the diet I was following was actually really up the wrong, going up the wrong path well and truly. And um, what I, and I also realised that there was a role for supplementation, but supplementation guided by good science, testing. And uh, that's where the, the, the hair tissue mineral analysis, the, the clinical one, there, there are a lot of wacky hair tissue tests out there. You've got to be very careful about which ones you do. And also um, who you have to do the interpreting. Um, it's very, very easy to get these wrong. As with any medical test, you've got to know how to interpret them and how to uh, apply them in the clinic. And um, so I started toying around with it, um, experimenting on other members of my family and uh, close friends and and then just gradually extending it as I got the hang and um, uh, for example um, I increased my um, heart not healthy foods uh, I went back to eating eggs on a daily basis um, we uh, rented a cow um, and uh, received uh, weekly deliveries of full cream unpasteurized milk uh, milk that sometimes had a third of it or a quarter being cream. Um, it was A1 protein, by the way. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, I increased my meat and fat intake and then supplemented on top of that with um, uh, special supplements, which again were guided by the hair tissue test. And to my surprise, um, my health and performance began to improve. And, uh, with the result that um, over the next 10 years, Keith, um, I've had uh, at least a 30% gain in performance over where I was um, um, in my 40s. Mind you, that was a pretty low point. Uh, but the, the simple fact of the matter is that, um, you know, anybody who's been following my uh, exploits as an athlete uh, can see that uh, I've continued each year to move up the ranks. Now, Keith, um, ju just one point. Uh, I've, I've moved up through the ranks in the age groups, but the most important thing, the most satisfying thing for me, is I've moved up through the general ranks. So, um, so today um, I'm competing in the A grade as a 66-year-old. Um, the like I just did a race over the weekend, and I came 13th out of about 260 riders. Um, and my last cyclocross up against some of the best um, cyclists in New Zealand, um, I, to my utter astonishment, came second in my last race. Um, I don't think I'm going to repeat that, but um, that was um, quite a performance. I couldn't believe it. Um, I think the other, just another point, Keith, is uh, there is a... As we get older, we tend to go more and more into just grinding out endurance. And uh, I've done the opposite. Uh, what I've done is, um, uh, is concentrated on the short, high-octane uh, competition. Uh, uh, races that are done and dusted within an hour 20 at the most. Uh, what I wanted to see, you see, you know, the common thing that people say is, oh, you know, uh, I'm getting older, I no longer have the speed, you know, um, and, you know, I want to demonstrate that that's not necessarily the case. Um, you know, the gun can go now, and I'm in the first three or four off the line. 
and uh, and that's something which I've been working on developing, and uh, and able to demonstrate it. Um, the, I, I did talk about you know disease management, that sort of thing, injury management. Uh, I still run, but um, I'll keep my runs down to less than an hour. Um, my typical runs are twenty minutes around the block in the morning. <laughs> at a at a very slow plot, I must admit. Uh, early morning is good because not many people get to see you. Well, what I do, Keith, is um, <clears throat> I use cycling uh, for doing my endurance work. Uh, so uh, uh, I don't. I no longer do long, hard grinds running. Um, uh, I find cycling is a lot gentler on the muscles and on the joints and tendons. Um, uh, so long as you don't fall off, uh, cycling has a very low injury rate. Um, you know, with that one proviso. <laughs> um, earlier this year, and at the very end of March, I um, a silly, uh, a silly thing. I went over the handlebars and um, and uh, almost well, I ended up temporarily paralysed, um, especially affecting my arms. Um, I, I suffered a, a contusion of the um, of the spinal cord in my neck, and um, and there was. Uh, it was a real medical emergency. I, I thought I was paralysed. Uh, I, I thought I'd be, you know, do, doing this interview, tapping uh, with a on the keyboard with a little stick on my in my mouth. Um, but um, what I what I did was I uh, used my knowledge of uh, rehabilitation. You know, rehab's been my field for the last. Well, I've got forty five years of experience in this, and um, and applied some really uh, uh, smart but aggressive um, uh, interventions in the way of um, careful exercise, careful rehabilitation in that way, but also nutritional support. I used, um, amongst other things, um, uh, systemic enzymes, uh, including seropeptase and, uh, and others, which um, uh, have uh, an anti-inflammatory effect. One of the things I was really concerned about, and certainly the neurosurgeons were concerned about, is um, uh, swelling of the spinal cord or of the tissues around and, um, and uh, the potential um, further damage and possible death of the spinal cord. And so that, that's where those systemic enzymes became very important of um, modulating the inflammatory process and also of um, uh, helping to, um, uh, well, yes, to, to help reduce uh, any buildup of fluid and um, and so on. Uh, I also used other things like Reparin, which is calcium phosphate monobasic, uh, which um, is um, concentrated in nerves and uh, is um, associated with um, supporting uh, nerve repair. I also took uh, things like acetyl alcarnitine, uh, which uh, help with um, the formation of the um, myelin sheath. So I did various things like that and um, and uh, my recovery has been, um, I think it's been remarkable. Uh, I've uh, got pretty much full neck function back. Um, it, it took a little bit of work, uh, but uh, you know, my neck works very well now. And um, I've still got a bit of um, numbness uh, just on that. You'll know more about this sort of stuff than me, Keith. Um, but I'm a little bit hypersensitive on uh, this part of my... Hypersensitive. Thing. Hypersensitive, yeah. So when I when I do that, it feels um, sort of like um, uh, I get a burning or a prickling sort of sensation. And it's very hard to describe. I've got my strength back and back to I'm um, doing my chin ups and press ups and you know and neck exercises and uh, I'm going to go from normal to um, being you know even stronger than ever. That's the goal. The nutritional therapy certainly um, helped, and and then um, I had three months going from basically hospitalisation. Um, to winning the world champs again. Um, I honestly didn't think I could do it, but um, you know, I bounced back really well and um, managed to beat the best in the world. So, was that extended rest possibly good for you for, for your uh, recovery? It, it wasn't a very extended rest, actually. It wasn't, but it was <laughs> I, rest, though. I was, uh, it was a few weeks. You can call me ex uh, slightly extreme when it comes to um, these things, Keith. I think no, we'll, I we'll go slightly past Slightly extreme. 
yes. just slightly. Yeah, that, that much past extreme, you know. But but the thing is, Keith, is that um, during like during that period, there wasn't a single time when I I sort of said, "Whoops, uh, that wasn't good." I'm very careful, very careful indeed. And um, and it and hey, it worked. You know, I did other things like I got myself a special helmet, a, a POC Octal, um, one that um, uh, helps to reduce concussion, you know, stress on the neck, that sort of thing. I did a whole lot of things. Um, uh, I did some modifications to my bicycle to reduce the possibility of um, uh, doing another face plant and, uh, you know, there a, a number of things, Keith. To, it's all about risk reduction. That's something I learned a lot from my years from working for ACC. And injury prevention. I want to ask you about uh, your regular training pattern when you're preparing for these world championships. Can you fill me in on what your regular weekly or fortnightly pattern was? I have a, worked out a, a pattern of training that seems to suit me. It doesn't, it won't necessarily suit anybody else, but it, it works, it works for me. Uh, and I know it works for me because uh, I monitor the and results in terms of uh, performance. There, there's a number of key um, key constituents. Um, one is that uh, about every two to three weeks, I try to get in an all day ride, something where I'm just simply on my bike from dawn till dusk. And that, depending on the terrain and the type of bike I'm using, uh, can amount to anywhere between 120 and 170 kilometers. It used to be very uh, testing, um, mainly on my backside and my shoulders. Uh, just, you know, the, the, the wear and tear on your bum is enough. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be agonizing. I, I seem to have worn into that quite well nowadays. And, uh, uh, but it's basically to just, um, without going hard or, you know, fast or anything, is to just develop that um, sheer endurance, the ability to just go and go and go. Um, now, it's not that I'm just putting my head down and going for it. Uh, I'm breaking it up into two or three hour blocks. So I'll ride for two or three hours. And when I'm starting to feel like I'm starting to flag, lose concentration, um, getting a bit hypoglycemic, I know that that's the time to stop and to have something to eat and also to drink and then um, perhaps have a bit of a stretch and then continue on my way. That's how I break it up. But it, in the end, it's a good seven hours, eight hours of solid cycling with breaks in between. That's something I've built into over a number of years. It's not like I've just gone and suddenly done them. The other component is that um, I... I've really fallen in love with doing what I call urban cyclocross. And uh, I'll do that about once a week. I'll get on my cyclocross bike and I'll explore every nook and cranny that I can find in Wellington on my bicycle. So I'll go up and down paths and uh, across fields and um, every single hill I come to, I'll take the steepest route up the hill. Um, and I will get off the seat and I'll stomp from the bottom to the top without putting my bum on the seat. It's very intense and uh, those rides can be anywhere from two to three hours. So they're, they're not short rides, um, but it's, um, it's like fart leg training, basically. Speed play, for want of a better. So uh, fast and slow and, you know, sort of like regathering and then you know, the next hill and up you go and then finding a, the steepest winding path downhill to practice, um, you know, your cornering and braking skills and so on. So that, that's, that's my urban cyclocross. And uh, I find that, that shoehorns beautifully into um, that ultra endur endurance work. I'll also put in one, at least one session where I'll just, get on my mountain bike and go and ride the hills like Tina, or, uh, sorry, um, Mount Cow Cow, um, the, the sort of dress circle around Wellington yeah. and um, practice some skills. Um, my, my uh, you know, uh, mountain biking, depending on the course, you know, in a race, um, it might be, say, 70% cardiovascular and power and strength and that sort of thing. Um, and it might be 20% 
or 30% of skill. The more technical the course, um, the greater the skill requirement. And, uh, and it's one of the areas where I, have a, I think I have a big advantage over most of my um, age group. I've got the skills to go and basically bomb um, courses that uh, most men my age would um, they'll, they'll sort of like go down it very cautiously, whereas I can just go bang straight into it. And that's the skill factor which um, uh, I work on all the time. Um, I'll practice breaking, cornering, um, you know, doing drop-offs, negotiating rocks. It's rocks and roots and so on. Uh, that, that the skill factor is incredibly important. And then on top of that, Keith, um, I'll go and chase races and use races for training. The races I generally target are short races. Uh, the, the Olympic style, which are around about one hour to one hour 20, probably equivalent to, say, a 3,000 metre steeplechase run or a, a, a standard cross-country race, you know, of 8K or something like that. Um, they're very intense. Um, they require a, a extraordinary level of skill to do well, uh, but they do not leave you wasted. Uh, the recovery is very quick. I have just recently done races, which a couple of races, which have taken like four hours or four and a half hours, that sort of thing. Um, I'm not keen on doing that because they, um, they, they they tend to take the edge off the high octane. You know, uh, I find that it, it takes, you know, the recovery time is too long. And, it, and uh, I think it takes a bit off the top end speed, as opposed to, you know, doing those very long, slow endurance rides uh, where, yeah, you're, you're tired, at the end, you know, definitely tired, but you haven't absolutely thrashed yourself at the ho at the top end, and then doing the thrashing at the top end in a very controlled manner, um, such as the urban cyclocross, and then doing short races. So I do a combination of those things. Now, but another thing is that um, one of the, I think as we get older, um, nutrition, disease management. This is where it really comes in. Um, I can do all of this, not because it's there, you know, me, mind over matter, you know, um, you know, ignore the pain and, you know, and ignore the fact that the heart's about to give out on you and that sort of thing, you know. Um, I do it because I've got the energy to do it. Um, I do it because I'm enjoying it. I'm doing it because my body says, hey, Gary, um, how about it, mate? When I've done it, I recover faster than I've ever recovered in my life. And, and that's where the nutritional therapies um, come in and uh, that investment over the last 15 or so years is really paying off. My competitors might say, that, that they'll, they might say, as, we, as you get older, you need to have longer recovery times. As I've got older, Keith, uh, my recovery times have actually shortened. I've gone against the trend. And um, so if people are wondering, why am I winning these high octane world championships? It's simply because I'm healthy enough to train harder, more intensely, more longer uh, than those that I'm up against. I'm taking on the, the young guys, the 20 year olds. And uh, yeah, the, the best of course are way out there. You know, I mean, the, <laughs> the yeah, I'll tell you what, there's some very, very good um, athletes, but you know, uh, all the rest, I'm giving most of them a run for their money and a good run. I hope that makes sense. Does that make sense, Keith? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you, you described essentially um, from the physiological side of things, you, you've, mm. you've laid down a, a huge aerobic base, or yep. you've laid down a base of health first, which is Yes. On the bottom of the pyramid, it's health first. Yep. Fitness second. Fit for what? Performance. Performance third. Yes. So it's health, correct. fitness, performance. So unless you got that healthy base, and then the aerobic base is on top of that, hmm. 
you can't perform at your peak. Yeah, you did right, Keith, and and you and I know that that's the um, that you know Lydia basically um, clicked to that formula, um, you know, back in the fifties, and um, and uh, and all, all I've done is I've taken all of that um, knowledge um, that that's developed over that type of training, and uh, and just refined it um, to apply to my own self. Just on that, um, you know, you, you're saying about that, you know, the base of the pyramid, uh, first of all, being health. Um, I've, I've often said, Keith, that you can take any talented young athlete and feed him or her any kind of shit, uh, and uh, you'll get a, you'll still get a great performance so long as you give them the right training program. Um, from about the age of 30, the um, uh, the game starts to change. Um, you can no longer just feed them anything. You know, aging it and uh, deficiencies and excesses and that start to become significant. And youthful vigor um, is no longer um, sufficient to um, completely negate those um, those factors. You, you might gather from what I'm uh, saying here, Keith, that most of what we consider to be the decrements of aging are actually controllable. Um, I, I think 80% um, of the disease that I um, deal with um, in my role as a health professional are uh, to um, some extent uh, preventable and in many cases um, also reversible. Many diseases that we have been taught are irreversible and at best the only thing we can do is uh, manage them, uh, I think is not true. Um, the, we, if we, but but um, reversing disease processes is not an easy, an easy exercise and uh, um, and most people leave it far too late. You know, like I was saying, I'm trying to stay about 20 years ahead of the game. Um, I use, um, use this testing to anticipate what might, um, uh, what might uh, adversely affect me uh, 20 years from now. My cardiovascular system was well and truly screwed uh, in my 40s. I I'd, I'd just totally burned myself out, Keith. Um, and uh, if I look at where I am today, um, my heart's actually getting stronger. You know, my cardiovascular work output is um, measurably, it's still improving. And I'm, I'm sort of thinking, crikey, you know, um, when's this going to end? And, uh, and what happens is that, you know, I do a bit more testing and I tweak something here and there might be a new discovery. Um, the, the beauty about the job I've got is that um, I'm getting bombarded, you know, my suppliers, you know, they'll, they'll write to me and they say, you know, we've just um, uh, bought in a new product and I'll have a look at it. I'm just doing this right now with a couple of products at this very moment. I've just ordered a couple of samples to um, try it. And of course, I'm going to experiment to myself um, and uh, see whether or not um, I get an extra heartbeat. Um, that, that one of the good things about racing, by the way, Keith, is that... Um, uh, it forces me to, um, you know, pretty well hit max on things, and I measure them with, you know, you know, modern bike computer technologies, you know, heart rate monitors and that sort of thing, and you know, heart rate variabilities. And you're talking about heart rates and heart rate variabilities. Yes. What is your maximum heart rate right now at your age? Um, well, in, in my last race, I um, maxed out 171, and That's very uh, I high. Think yeah, I think it's probably 172, 173, and um, and that that was uh, in a um, a race that took almost three hours, and I averaged I think about 145. It was probably probably closer to 150, um, which uh, means that as a percent, uh, I'm right up there, um, and being able to sustain it for a very very long period, that's what the training's done. Uh, and, and the nutrition, by the way, um, because, you know, um, as you deplete certain nutrients, um, antioxidants and so on, uh, you basically get systems failure, you know, in your mitochondria and that. And, um, and you know, so, so the, the, the nutrient side, um, two things. One is getting the nutrients in. But I'll tell you what, one of the areas, don't tell our competitors this, they keep. One of the key areas during intense and exhausting exercise, one of the limits is um, 
uh, the rate at which your body can get rid of the metabolic wastes, okay? You know, uh, you can't just force everything into a cell without bringing something out. And, uh, and if, you, if, you're, if you're force feeding uh, nutrients uh, into your cells, you've got to make sh sure that your cells are being effective at detoxifying. You go, so the quicker you can get rid of those metabolic um, byproducts, um, the, um, the, the, the longer and harder you can keep going. You know, so it's a two-way thing. It's got to go in, it's got to come out. And, um, and from what I can see, most of um, sports nutrition is about stuffing as much as they can into a cell. Sugar-based, mostly? <laughs> well, yes. I, I do um, a program of um, uh, things like delayed eating. Um, if I'm not hungry, I won't eat. Uh, I, um, I've discarded the mantra that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Um, uh, I will delay having breakfast usually until 10 or 11 o'clock uh, until I'm hungry. Um, you see, if you're not hungry, then don't eat. Um, you know, um, how can you have breakfast if you're not fasting? You can't break a fast if there is not a fast. And um, so, uh, so what I'll do is I'll and and what I'll do is I'll break the fast with a high protein, high fat meal, and with high quality carbohydrates. Um, uh, my partner and life was homemade muesli. Um, uh, and, and a couple of uh, free range eggs from my neighbor's parents, and so on. And, uh, and what I'm sending a signal to my, um, to my body is that um, times are plenty, you know, the, the food is extremely rich in nutrients and that sort of thing, and Gary's hard working, so he must be working hard to bring in the harvest. And, um, and so instead of laying down fat, uh, my body gets a message with that first meal to lay down muscle and other lean tissue. So Keith, um, when I was in my 20s uh, trying to run with you, <laughs> yeah, I know, <laughs> uh, trying is the word, um, my body weight was around about uh, 61 kg. So in my 20s, I was around about 61, and I never varied. My weight right now is 66 kilograms. Um, I have put on a lot of muscle, and here's the thing. I haven't been in a gym for 20 years. Um, I've just put on muscle. My lean weight, my upper body, my, um, my strength, everything has improved from just doing a few press-ups and pull-ups here at home. And I put it down to uh, the alteration of eating habits and also the, um, the quality of the exercise I do. Um, the, um, the high intensity training and the, well, the mix of high intensity plus um, uh, long, slow distance, uh, fat burning. Um, I do, um, uh, when I'm doing, um, doing my training, I do restrict the carbohydrates I have. Um, but there is some by default in some of the um, uh, some of the mixes I take. But um, one of the things that has changed enormously is that um, if I did a if I did a a, a brisk mountain bike ride um, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, I would have to have something sugary at around about an hour twenty. Uh, I can now go for three hours without having to do so. During a race that is, say, one hour 20 or less, I don't need any sugar at all. All I need is um, to take some water if it is, if I'm going to, if it's a hot day. Um, but minimal sugar, I don't need it. Um, it's only when I'm getting into the three, four hour races that I'll, I will definitely add sugar for the ability to be able to sprint, the ability to be able to just absolutely dig in anaerobically at the highest level. The thing that I have really noticed is that my, um, uh, my endurance without relying on sugar has improved enormously. It's doubled or tripled. It's, it's really, um, I'm delighted with it. Um, the, the other thing, Keith, is that I can now go for long periods without 
you know, just during the day, like I am now, um, on um, without having to have snacks. It wasn't long ago, and I think it still is some um, standard fare, that sports nutritionists would say that you've got to have a snack every two hours, you know, to avoid hypoglycemia. I used to subscribe to that. Um, I used to subscribe to the belief that, you know, within half an hour of a workout, you need to have um, a carbohydrate and protein meal. Um, I don't worry about that now. If somebody's asked me about that, I'll say, well, yeah, have, yeah, have something to eat. Um, it must be nutrient dense, but um, have it when your body tells you that you're ready to eat. You, you're preaching to the converter though. Oh. So uh, I, I know Keith, um, but um, uh, we can enjoy, um, you know, uh, enjoy life in our in our in our uh, our shared bubble of knowledge. Yes, yes, luxuriate in that bubble of knowledge. I know. Okay. Well, thanks, Gary.